Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement in the Fairfield University Art Museum. We hope that your especially fellow Fairfield students will be slowly coming in after the 6 o'clock hour. And just point out there are still snacks at the back of the room, and our bar remains open if you need a little bit of refreshment. Uh, but I am delighted to welcome all of you to tonight's panel on Women as Managers, Then and Now. And we are presenting this panel in conjunction with the exhibition Hildreth Mier, The Art of Commerce, which is on in our Bellarmine Hall galleries just up the hill, only until Saturday. So we are hoping to entice those of you who haven't seen it yet on your seats. You'll find the brochure for the show to give you a little bit of a sense of what Hildreth's art was like. So please come up and see it before it closes on Saturday. And in fact, the idea for having this panel and having it with the Dolan School of Business came out of conversations between myself and the museum's executive director, Carrie Weber, as we were learning more about Hildreth Mier, who is an artist whose work can be found in more than 100 sites across the United States, and that's from the Dome of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC, to Temple Emanuel and uh, the banking room of One Wall Street in New York, to the lobby of Travelers Insurance Building in Hartford. And we were wondering what it was like for Hildreth to operate in what was at the beginning of the 20th century very much a man's world, and to do so in the curious position of someone who is both a manager in terms of overseeing the work of the men who turned her designs into massive mosaics and murals, and then also as um, uh, a client in the sense that she was working for architects who commissioned her to work in their buildings. So if you come up to our exhibition and you look at the labels, one thing you will notice is that the same names of architectural firms and also these workmen, these artisans, the same names come up over and over again, which tells you that she was able to form really strong relationships both with the people she was overseeing and the people for whom she was working, which I think says a lot about Hildreth. Uh, so she had to have been doing something right, but it cannot have been easy. And from there, we were kind of wondering, well, what would it be like for Hildreth today? And then we thought, well, we should find some women who are managers and we should ask them. And here we are with our illustrious panel. Uh, and I'd like to take a minute to thank our partners, without whom tonight's event would not be happening. And first, our co-sponsors, our partners here in the Dolan School of Business, Sarah, Eve, and John, and in whose beautiful new space our event is being held. And also to Hilly Dunn, who is Lu uh, Hildreth Mier's granddaughter, who's here with us this evening, who is instrumental in bringing the beautiful exhibition to our museum. And finally, to all of our panelists, who have, some of whom have traveled a great distance from Hartford, Connecticut, to be with us here tonight. And we're all generously sharing their perspective with us. And I just want to point out that one of the strengths of a liberal arts education, of a Jesuit liberal arts education, is that it pushes us to learn from the perspective of people who are not like us or who see the world differently from us so that we can build a world with greater empathy and greater inclusion. And in that spirit, I'll be inviting each of our panelists to share a brief reflection and before we move into a conversation that involves all of us here in this room. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Elizabeth Hull. Dr. Hull is the Assistant Professor of the Practice and the History Department here at Fairfield in the College of Arts and Sciences. And she teaches courses in 19th century American history and women and gender studies. And her area of interest focuses on the experience of late 19th century African American women. Dr. Hull. How are you? Hello, everybody. How are we tonight? Here's your history moment. OK. So excited there's no quiz at the end of this. <laughs> so my job isn't to talk about my experience as a manager, but rather to think about Hildreth Mier uh, in the context of the world in which she grew up. So that's my very simple question. How do we understand her life and work in the context of women's history? So here's the premise. Uh, she was a new woman. Uh, born in Flushing, New York at the beginning stages of the Progressive Era, which is also known as the Jim Crow Era. Uh, she joined a cohort of women who were regarded as advanced, uh, as forward-thinking, as new. And uh, you need to know that the new woman was the subject of a lot of controversy, um, commentary, and frequent worry. But by the 1890s, her, her arrival was absolutely positively undeniable. And there are lots of reasons for this paradigm shift, why people started to use the adjective new. But I know when I say paradigm shift, sometimes that makes people's palms sweat. Uh, so let me just give you a quick uh, example of what I mean, because what we really have here is a paradigm shift um, uh, uh, with regard to gender. So I need you to visualize wearing a full-length dress, wearing a, a corset, 
a gloves, hat, and a parasol in 1850. Okay, have it in your heads. Uh, and then picture exchanging it for a sleeveless, knee-length uh, satin sheath with bare arms, legs, uh, and low-heeled shoes. Okay, to some extent, that's how you visualize the paradigm shift, right? From mid-century uh, heavy uh, clothing, skirts, etc., cetera, uh, to uh, clothing that is actually following uh, function, right? The ways in which women's lives have changed. And of course, that's, that was a kind of easy way for me to ask you to visualize it, understand that the new woman is the product of much uh, longer term trends, all kinds of things from industrialization, uh, immigration, urbanization, longer lifespans, uh, the development of the germ theory, uh, better nutrition, uh, access to education, um, uh, changes in politics and the public arena. Uh, and it's within that context that we need to understand uh, how she enters this world as part of this cohort. Keep in mind also that uh, in addition to those longer term trends, we have to take into account other key factors, and that means uh, women's agency, uh, their sense of mission, uh, self-described impulse to purposeful action, and of course, collective activism. Hildreth Mier understood she benefited from the women's movement of the 19th century. Uh, this movement challenged traditional beliefs about women's intellectual inferiority, uh, and singular destiny in marriage and maternity. She acknowledged the uh, organized effort to transform women's roles and status in a mural actually commissioned by the National Council of Women um, entitled The Progress of Women, 1833 to 1933. I think it's at Smith these days, but we can check that. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, this work actually highlighted the suffrage victory uh, in 1920, uh, and again, notice she's doing this 13 years later. It's still seen as a massive uh, change. She has something really interesting in this mur mural because she starts out with uh, prison bars fairly close together and, and they become farther and farther apart as you move to what she regarded as the suffrage victory. Um, this is a woman who enjoyed tremendous uh, a support system uh, in her youth. Her parents, uh, Ernest and Marie, Marie herself, an aspiring painter, um, backed her dream. Right? This is a child who says, I want to be an artist. And they say, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and they had the financial wherewithal to do so. Now, that didn't mean that the art world uh, scheduled fireworks when they caught wind of her plans. Uh, she faced many closed doors and once said she could easily sport the title, and I'm going to get this right, founder and president of the Association of Lady Applicants meaning she heard more than her fair share of no's. Uh, but she always adjusted to the circumstances. The Bose Art Institute uh, ironically excluded uh, her and all women, so she went to the New York School of Applied Design for Women instead. Convenient, it was founded actually the year that she was born. She kept her focus and she kept her sense of humor. When the Architectural League finally admitted women, she became a member, and that was six years after they'd given her the gold medal. Uh, the New York, Arts, uh, New York City Arts Commission welcomed her as their first female member and invited her to a formal black tie dinner. Now, she's the only woman, so she, yes, she showed up in a black tie, but I understand she also wore a gorgeous low-necked black gown as well. Uh, so again, great that she had a, a sense of humor. Uh, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you think about her work, you can see her presiding uh, in her Manhattan studio uh, over this, these massive works uh, in which she was engaged. Uh, she was figuring out how to collaborate uh, with architects and craftsmen, manage male employees, line up vendors, deal with clients, right? Everything from the National Council of Women to the Nebraska legislature, who knew? Um, she had to organize and sequence all the phases of these massive projects. Uh, she was not only renowned for her distinctive Art Deco style, uh, she developed a reputation for reliability and professionalism. One architect exclaimed, once the job was in her hands, you can forget about it, assured it will be done right and on time. It's quite a reputation to have. From the New York Papers uh, accounts, uh, detail uh, that she networked and schmoozed with the best of them. And uh, she understood that she was both an artist and a businesswoman. 
Like many women then and now, she navigated the tension between her identity as a woman and as a professional. It wasn't that she didn't acknowledge both, but we can understand to some extent her frustration. This is something Georgia Keefe said at one point. Um, what does a gendered adjective before the word artist mean? What does that mean? Uh, one of her biographers suggested that Mier uh, thought a woman had to know her job better than a man to succeed as a muralist, but she, she said she never felt dismissed or discriminated against. But I wonder, occasionally she must have had to kind of take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath um, uh, when she heard herself referred to as him in a newspaper article mm -hmm. uh, or heard her contributions to the World's Fair of 1939 as coming from the country's leading woman muralist. Uh, she once confided to a friend, I've worked as an equal with men and my rating as an equal is all I value. Still, she racked up many firsts, including the first women artist, there it is, okay, first women artist, to receive the Fine Arts Medal from the American Institute of Architects in 1956. Her resume was lengthy and substantial. Right? It was peppered with many professional responsibilities, such as officer in the Art Students League and the National Society of Mural Painters. It's also abundantly clear that she encouraged future artists. Uh, as a role model for the next generation, she constantly gave talks before young people. Her personal life also embraced modernity. Uh, later in life, she married Richard von Goebel and had a daughter when the marriage ended. She raised her child as a devoted single parent, as did many professional women of her era. She retained her birth name, technically making her what we would call a Lucy Stoner, named after a 19th century activist. Um, it's clear affection for her work remained constant. She expressed enthusiasm, she felt, when her mother took her on a trip to Italy after high school graduation. I fell in love once and for all with mural painting and great beautiful walls. Like many women, she was a force in the public arena, and there are lots of things I could tell you about her work during World War I as a mechanical draftsman. Uh, I could talk about her work in the Depression uh, for the WPA, uh, impressive relief work that she does for the Spanish and the French, uh, also in the 30s and 40s. Uh, she has an impressive uh, 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 role that she plays in World War II, uh, organizing um, other artists to assist. Um, but I think what's most impressive about her as a new woman is that she worked uh, as a professional almost continuously over a 40 year period, right? No guarantee about employment. And that's an extraordinary level of success. Um, she liked to think of herself as a Catholic artist and in that sense, Catholic meaning uh, universal. Uh, she had very clear ideas about what should and shouldn't occur. Lovely comment from her in the newspaper after the Rockefeller Center uh, announced the mural contest, and she was like, hmm, I really think it's the architect who should determine what this is nonsense about a, about a contest. All of the photographs of Mier uh, as an adult situate her as looking off to the side, maybe in the direction of her work, a clue perhaps to her success, and to the art we continue to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hole, for those remarks. And our second speaker is Dr. Catherine Giappone, who is Associate Professor of Management here in the Dolan School of Business. She started her career in the business world, as I understand, before transitioning to academia, and she teaches courses on business strategy and the management of nonprofit organizations. Dr. Giappone. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to spend my time talking a little bit about, um, uh, about Hildreth in terms of the business world and women in, in business. And uh, I think my, my colleagues here are going to talk about specific examples relating to their own personal growth and development as women in management. But I wanted to do a, a little broad brush first, and, and that is that um, I think she exemplified um, a respective business person. I'm going to use the word person, business person. I think she'd probably prefer that to businesswoman. Um, she was able to effectively leverage her skills um, and as an artist um, to create really a successful business um, and um, 
And I, I had the same quote that Liz had um, about from the architect who basically said the, that once the job is in her hands, you can forget about it, you're assured it's done right, it's done on time, high quality, um, good craftsmanship. So she leveraged her talents and her skills, which I think for all of us, we want to really have an awareness of what our talents and skills are and how we can leverage those. Um, so she was highly respected for both her talent and her work ethic, and I think that is, was really key to her success as a business person. I think the other thing that Liz briefly mentioned was the idea that, and, and Michelle also mentioned, I think her collaborative orientation was phenomenal. I mean, for a woman in management, um, she focused on a, a collaborative approach to what she did. She collaborated, as Michelle said, um, with her clients who were her, the architects, um, with the craftsmen she worked with, but also with the clients for whom the, the, the total project right, was being developed. And, um, and there, there were times where she um, kind of changed some things based on the clients coming and saying, well, I, th I think it was in the Nebraska uh, State House that she actually made some changes you know, based on client needs and what they were looking for. There were other times where she pushed back a little bit, right? And sometimes it went back to her original pieces. Um, and so it sounded to me, and I didn't know her, and you know more about her than I do, but that she had a really collaborative approach. She listened. She listened to the client. She listened to the architect. And she always talked about looking, looking, looking to fit the right project um, with the right client, um, the appropriate materials. So I, I kind of like that idea of a collaborative orientation toward management. Um, as Michelle and I talked about earlier today, if you, if you look at her art, um, there's, she had um, ongoing relationships with many of the same architects, with many of the same clients, um, and the same craftsmen. So obviously, she did something really right in building those relationships. And I think for, for management, for women in management, that's really critical that it's, it, to me, it's, it's all about relationship building. And it, see, it appears to me, based on the outcome, that she was a really effective um, manager that way. Um, but I do also see her, we haven't heard the term entrepreneur. I see her as an entrepreneur. To me, this was an entrepreneurial venture, right? It's a first of its kind. She built a business for herself, <clears throat> and she was able to leverage her talents and skills and in building that business. And a few things I saw that I, I believe, um, number one, I think she, she was confident in her work and in her talent, and because she uh, adopted those at a very early age, she was confident in her skills, and to me that's really important for an entrepreneur. Second thing, innovative. Um, she, she worked with all different kinds of materials. Um, she broke with tradition in some of the ways that she did things. So she was highly innovative, and she wasn't afraid to innovate. And I thought, to me, that is the sign of an entrepreneur. They talked about her blending different influences from Byzantine, Egyptian, and Greek influences, for example, and the whole you know, evolution of the Art Deco style. So she really was an innovator. So I, again, that contributed to my perception of her as a true entrepreneur. The other thing about her that I really I, I liked was, again, in that development, I saw her as in the Jesuit tradition, a lifelong learner. I kind of saw her as an individual that in that continual development of her craft and her art, she was continuing to learn and grow and develop. And to me, that's at the heart of our education here at Fairfield, which I think is so important. Um, so my reflection on her is that, um, and I think for any of us to be lifelong learners, you have to be open not only of mind but of heart in order to embrace that. And so that's my vision of her, that she was open of mind and heart to developing her craft, to developing her art, um, to doing better by her clients. Um, and I think that is, that is really key. Also, I think you have to be a little humble for that also. And I think the fact that she did listen to her clients sometimes said that there was, there was an element, she was a humble individual as well as the way that I perceive her based on a few things that I read about her. Um, I think the biggest thing that has stuck with me in reflecting on her life and her work was her passion. There was great passion. She knew that that was going to be her, in quotes, and they, a lot of articles talked about vocation. When you have a career or a job, it's one thing. But if when your career or your job is your vocation, to me it is everything. Because that's when I think you bring so much of yourself to what you do. And I think, um, I um, had a phrase here, I said, I think when one's gifts and talents intersect with your passion, 
there is nothing that can stop you in terms of what you can achieve and accomplish in life. And I see her as an exemplar of that. I see her, her talents um, in art, her talents as a craftsman um, were, you know, were of highest caliber and she was passionate about the arts and she was passionate about kind of furthering um, the craft um, in, in, the, in the area that she was involved in. So for me, that kind of came out to me. Um, I tell my students all the time, find your passion because I think if you find your passion, you're going to be successful in business, and we can bring that passion in a variety of ways to the jobs and how we do our jobs. Um, but if you can self-reflect on what are our st internal strengths and how can we bring those and um, translate that into a business. So I think for Hildreth, to me, the power of passion probably combined with her self-awareness of her talents, I think enabled her to really create these beautiful works to, to achieve over 100 commissions, um, which I think is phenomenal for someone of her era. Um, and so to me, she's a great exemplar of that whole idea of, of translating something you love into a true vocation in life. Um, I just, I resonate a little bit with this because as, as Michelle mentioned, I'm a, tra a change of career educate, I'm a change of career person. Um, in my, when I was in my 40s, you know, I um, had an adjunct position and I went into the classroom and it was like, oh my God, I love this, you know? I felt like the learning and the energy of the environment, I just felt like I was so excited, I was exhilarated. I remember driving home and my husband was home and I, it, was, it was a weekend college program that I was involved in and I was so excited, he still remembers that. And I said, I love this. I said, I think this is what I've meant to do, you know? And it was kind of that realization, that moment where, you know, your passion is lit and you just feel like, yeah, I think this is what I was always meant to do. And I feel like with Hildreth, there, I think that's what she was meant to do too, right? That was her life's calling, her vocation. And so, um, so at the age of, uh, I was in my 40s that, uh, and I think Lil, uh, probably Liz has a similar story too, but I was in my 40s and I went back um, to get my doctoral degree. I had an MBA at that point. I had a couple small kids and I said no. And, um, and, and similar to her, I guess, in, in thinking about this, um, you know, hurdles and obstacles to doing that at my age. A lot of people say, no, you're too old. Why are you, why are you doing this? One minute. Um, and, um, but I think that when you have that passion, and I also, I also think if I look back on my life, I was always a teacher at heart. I, when I worked, they always said, Kathy, can you train the new financial analyst? You know, you're, you're good at that. Can, I was a tutor in college. I mean, I think I always had that in me and kind of getting that, gaining that self-awareness and, and realizing that that really was my passion. So I, I was sort of inspired to read about her because I really believe that she is one who integrated her passion with a, a tremendous talent and that just enabled her to achieve uh, greatness and to, um, and to create a business in a sense for herself that was so, so phenomenal. So, um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll finish there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Giappone. So if Dr. Hull and Dr. Giappone have been giving us the internal Fairfield University reflections, mm -hmm. both from the College of Arts and Sciences side, represent, and as well as from the Dolan School of Business side, we turn now to some of our welcome guests from outside Fairfield, and we are starting with Maisie Russell. Maisie is the second vice president of tax at Travelers Insurance. She's responsible for managing state income tax compliance, research planning, and audits. And speaking of merging that sort of passion and vocation, she said on our call that she loves tax so much she is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Hartford teaching <laughs> state and local taxation. So yes, this is someone who loves taxes. Uh, she also is engaged in the arts. She's on the board of the Costume and Textile Society at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. She's also a trustee of the Amistad Center for Arts and Culture. Maisie Russell. Okay, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And um, I'll just go right into it. Confidence, grit, and determination. Those were the words that were imparted to me growing up as a child. My mother always said to me, you can do anything that you put your mind to. And she lived it. So just for a minute, just indulge with me. My mom in 1973, had a vision to start an ele elementary school in her community. So she wrote a letter to the prime minister in Jamaica to get funds for that school. She received a response from him saying, you, thank you very much, but I'm so sorry that I cannot give you the funds for that. She did not use that no to dim her dreams. She went ahead and she actually founded the elementary school and that school still exists, but in a different form. So that's basically 
confidence, grit, and determination. As a student pursuing my master's in taxation, I was the only female and the only African American in all my classes. And I recall one of the professors, um, a student in my class, we both had the same last name, and he vocally said, make sure, to the professor, make sure you don't confuse our names or our grades. I also had other um, classes where I had to talk to the professor because no one in all my classes wanted, to, wanted me to be on their project team. But I used those challenges to be one of the top students. And how ironic it is that I actually teach in various tax classes at that same university. Mm -hmm. That is confidence, gr grit, and determination. Throughout my career, I've had challenges, and I've handled them the same way. And I don't want you to put your hand up, but how many of you have had this statement said to you, you have to prove yourself. I've had that several times. But I use that as a determination to do exceptionally well. So I said to myself when those statements were made to me, I said, you know what? Not only am I good, but I'm actually even better than most of you here. <laughs> so I've done, I've done that throughout my career for various instances. So I, too, have a lot of confidence, grit and determination. So I've always done very well and try to work very hard, even more than my peers, but it has paid off. So that's okay with that. I work for a great company that supports my growth. A few years ago, based on my performance and my leadership skills, I was nominated to attend Black Enterprise Women of Power Summit. And that is a summit with over 600 powerful women from across the country. I went back to the office with more empowerment. I felt like I was just so empowered about my career and I wanted to do more. So I scheduled a one-on-one -on -one with my boss. And we sat down and we spoke and I shared with him some things that I wanted to do, I wanted to do more, and I laid out a lot of things that I wanted to do. And within a few months, I was promoted. And he said to me, do you remember that conversation that we had? So again, you have to basically not be afraid to do anything. About three years ago, I had this great thought and talking about innovation, to innovate my area, to go paperless for two of my units. And I actually did that with my staff talking about innovation. So now for one of my units, we can, they can, actu we can actually do a tax return from preparation all the way through filing from even a remote location. So again, I'm going back to basically being um, confident and have a lot of grit and determination in what you do. So be confident and be determined. Believe in yourself. Own who you are and distinguish yourself among your peers. Think outside the box and challenge the process. That's innovation. And stay current and present new ideas. About uh, two days ago, I actually was invited to a meeting because of all these things that I'm doing. I'm actually doing exactly what I'm saying. I'm actually taking action and doing all these different things. So I was actually invited to that meeting. I'm very intentional about things that I do. And say, for example, going to a, 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 a meeting in a conference room, I deliberately don't sit on the sideline. And I make sure I sit at the table. I only sit on the sideline if there's no more room at the table. And I deliberately sit at the table because I want to be a part of the discussion and a part of the solution. So I am very intentional about those things that I do. So as leaders, we should collaborate, I heard that word, inspire, motivate, empower others to act. And as women, we need to have a lot of confidence, grit, and determination through all of our executions. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Confidence, grit, and determination. Those are three really great terms for every one of us to take away from here tonight. Thank you so much, Maisie Russell. Our next speaker is Lauren Berry, also with Travelers. And I just want to reiterate again that Travelers is sponsoring the show in no small part because these ladies are privileged to have a work by Hildreth Mier adorning one of the entrances to one of the five, is it five Travelers buildings in Hartford now? Okay. There are a lot more than we thought. We just assume like, oh, you've got it in your building, right? And they're like, there are a lot of buildings. <laughs> Nonetheless, they have an intimate connection to the subject of our exhibition, so we're so happy for both of them to be participating. And Lauren is Vice President and Chief Underwriting Officer of Travelers Global Inland Marine, which offers commercial underwriting across a variety of sectors, including construction, renewable energy, and fine arts, which includes museums, which includes us. So they are the underwriter of the university, and the museum is pleased to be able to say they are also covering our assets, let us say. Uh, we'll now welcome Lauren Berry. Thank you, thank you so much. And I was so moved by Maze. I have to hug you. <laughs> <laughs> what a speech, you know, that was just um, very, uh, I feel very lucky to be part of the panel and to, uh, to be, we started to become friends, just yes. uh, thank you for putting us together. Um, what I do, part of what I do is in the fine art area, it's probably, one of um, very fun things that I do. My dad is an artist, and ever since, uh, I grew up in New York, like uh, Hildreth also, um, and I'm so excited about going to New York and going back to see all of the exhibits. Mm -hmm. I, so many times I've gone to Radio City Music Hall, I've gone to uh, St. Bart's. Now I can really appreciate it so fully after this so so thank you and thank you Fairfield for having us um, we we do insure the museum and we insure this building under construction oh. so uh, and the underwriter is right there there's Christine so she's been very close she's happy to see it so beautiful and functional and, and up and running so um, so really appreciate it um, I don't live in New York anymore. I live in Connecticut, and I'm in, I live in Connecticut with um, two boys, with um, a son that's 14 named Jack, and um, I have a corgi that's three years old named Chumley. <laughs> and uh, they both keep me, keep me hopping all the time, and both have insatiable appetites. I've never, the corgi's gaining a little weight, but the son is just getting taller and taller. So um, so part of um, some of the things that I'm involved in from a volunteer standpoint and also from some of the challenges that I've been, uh, encountered uh, as time goes on, I, um, I'm the president of youth football I was and now uh, the high school football and I've also coached football if you can believe it looking at me. But um, And uh, to be close to really to to be close to my son to help out with that. And when I listen, Hildreth uh, exposing herself to areas that are mostly men and where probably um, she was kind of breaking, breaking barriers there. I feel like very often uh, it, it, it's a challenge. I've had jobs where I became a manager. I was 29, 28, 29 and I became a manager of a staff that was all men, and that was men in the 50s and 60s. And I, I feel some things I've learned over time, you, you have to learn from them. You have to learn from the football coaches. You have to learn from the 50 and 60 year olds. You have to, you have to be very humble and say, you, you don't know how to do everything. You, you will make mistakes, and please, please forgive me. And, um, and try not to make mistakes more than once. But you need to learn from them. And you also need to really listen and to think about what, what do they want? What are their expectations? How can you make their lives better? And um, how, how can they help you, too, be successful? When, when I first became a manager, I was um, kind of a little nervous about it. And uh, I really, as a team, it, it was um, a very um, testosterone heavy team, not only the football coaches, but also some of the, some of the underwriters that I was involved with. And I, um, I, made, uh, I made everyone take Myers-Briggs because I wanted to know what type they were, get some insight into them immediately, and also how they interact with each other and really to try to maximize the group dynamics. So, uh, so I think some coaching there, if you're ever faced with, 
you know, you kind of have a, a group you want to try to connect with. I think those studies like that, um, tools like that, I think they're very helpful. Um, I think listening is the best thing. But, um, but, but that's been uh, different challenges along the way. I did have a career change that I can relate to. Um, when I grew up in an Italian family in New York, and I think I was about four years old, and I must have argued with a lot or just wanted to prove my point. So my family decided I should be an attorney. So, you know, that would be great. You know, she's, she's got the mouth on her. <laughs> so, so, um, so really my whole life was channeled to law. Um, I was on the community board as a volunteer in high school. I got um, a law clerk job at New York City Council. I worked with, as a law clerk. And, and I went to Emory undergrad and then Emory Law School. And then once I was in law school, probably two weeks in, I really wasn't happy. And I was doing a lot of soul searching and um, I was terrified to tell my family because they, they were talking about Supreme Court justices and all <laughs> those things. So, um, but I, I hung in there for two years <laughs> in law school and um, I, uh, I paced myself with kind of letting my parents know little bit by little bit. And um, it came down to I was interviewing and I got a job in the New York City District Attorney's Office in the RICO division because I guess Italian background and mafia, <laughs> they, they kind of put me in. Um, so I got a job there and also I had a job with Chubb in insurance and um, I wound up going the insurance route and I really never look back. I, I enjoy insurance, I enjoy the variety, um, the people that you meet, the different operations, and it was just for me. Law school is fabulous for so many people and they're great attorneys, but I think doing soul searching and knowing what you have a passion for and where you really fit is, um, is very important. And uh, I don't have the sign yet, so up. Oh, do I have the sign now? One minute. Okay, I'll be really quick. Um, last thing, just on having a support system. I um, I decided in one year to um, get divorced, change jobs, and buy a house. And uh, I had a four-year-old at the time too, so. I learned very quickly, no way can you do that yourself. And I got a very good support system from my family, but I also recruited my son's daycare teacher as, a, as kind of a temporary nanny. And I, to this day, she's part of the family and everyone that helped me, I'm just so grateful that I was able to do that. It, you, you can't do, especially with big change, you definitely need to lean on others. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That's another great thing to take away, right? The need to lean on others. That's wonderful. And last but not least among our panelists tonight is Margarita Pinedo Ucero. She served for almost 20 years as the Chief Risk Officer for GE Capital Latin America and continues to work in that sector as a consultant today. She's also the founder of the Women Dignity Alliance, which is based here in Stanford, and that's an international organization helping women unlock their potential while finding balance and making choices in their lives with corporate or entrepreneurial careers. Margarita. Thank you. Uh, well, I was 20 years in G Capital, but not the 20 years was I the chief risk officer of Latin America, so I want to make that correction. <laughs> I don't want to give you um, all the wrong impression, but it takes because it takes time to develop your career to actually make it to a chief risk officer position as my colleagues here in the financial services field would um, allow me to um, you know, share on that. But um, so let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, as you probably guessed from the name and now from the accent, I, um, I was not born in the US and English is not my first language. I was born in Mexico and that's where I went to undergraduate school. I went to engineering school. And sometimes you wonder, why do people choose a particular field in undergraduate studies? And sometimes it has very little to do with the fact that um, you actually know what you want to do in life. I had the impression that engineers were intelligent people, and I wanted to prove the world uh, to the world that I was intelligent, because that's what I thought. So I figured, OK, 
I'll go to engineering school. And because I was good at math, I went on. I graduated, and how little did I know that a woman in Mexico in the 80s, being an engineer, had no hope of finding a job. So I had two options when I graduated. I could, you know, just fight all the fights to try to get a miserable job as an engineer or be creative and identify what were the skill set um, options that I had already in my tool to actually do something. And there was a bank at that point in time that was hiring engineers training them on analysis of financial statements, and was running a program to train these engineers to be credit analysts and account managers in banking. So I joined the program and quickly was able to actually develop tremendously in financial services and identified that it was a great field and had a lot of fun doing it. And because I was good at math and sequential thinking that could, uh, could understand actually the manufacturing processes of many of our clients and when they were explaining to us the type of financing they needed in project finance and the many complexities of the things they were doing. As an engineer, I actually could relate a lot with what our clients needed and started to succeed in the field. So one of the first things I learned early in my career was that it is not as much about the specific field of your domain expertise earlier in your career as it is about the skill set that you start developing. In my case, for instance, was depth in analytics, the ability to have sequential thinking, listening well and understand what the other side needed, how to translate that into a solution for the other in terms of you know financial um, services or a credit uh, program. Of course, was working with my uh, mentors and boss and others uh, up or up in the bank to uh, teach me how to structure deals. And then I started to learn and enjoy putting deals together and seeing how fun that was. So for those of you who have ideas in banking, financial services, deal structuring, and all of those things that are like that, go for it. It's super fun. So I continued <coughs> progressing in banking and the finance, uh, financial services world, but then the second thing happened to me. And this is a little bit on the personal side. I wanted to have a boyfriend and get married. Um, something pretty normal for a girl about my age at that time. But men in Mexico were a little bit afraid of me, I think. <laughs> Because I looked at like a little bit too threatening, you know? Oh my gosh, she has this job. Maybe she makes more money than I do, right? Or sometimes they approached me, you know, guys, I'm no offense to any men in this room. Uh, 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 hi. And they're like, hi. And then they, you know, would not develop any interesting conversation to my definition of interesting. And in two or three pieces, I would make the guy die. So for those of you who are super smart girls and have a great job or already get yourselves into a great job and want to get married, don't marry or, or start dating an idiot. That's not what I'm saying because that's not what you want. But, but give the other side a chance because you are so self-confident, so self-centered, so busy with your job and how good you are, and others already are telling you that, that perhaps you have right in front of you a great guy who's going to be a great partner in life for you, and you shut him down at hello, or three words after hello. <laughs> Don't do it. Right? And guys, if you're approaching a smart girl, do your homework. Don't come just with hello. You know, come with hello and a couple of other interesting things to say after that. Anyway, time went by and I met my Prince Charming. I'm still married to him 25 years later. 
Thank you. Um, great guy, smart guy. We had amazing conversations. Now, the poor guy, if he were hearing me now, and I know you're going to post this somewhere, so <laughs> we'll see. But the first few conversations we had were on Exim Bank financing for uh, specific types of transactions that were for emerging markets in banking. I mean, he is in import exports, so he knew about it. And uh, poor guy, I mean, he comes, says hello, and I go, where do you work? And he tells me where he works, and I'm like, oh, so are you familiar with blah, 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 uh, financing package of the Exim Bank? And the guy says, oh, yes, I am. And I'm thinking, oh, he is. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, well, do you know blah, blah, blah? And he knows, right? He goes, uh, yes. He didn't know, but he made it up a little bit. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> Sounded good enough. <laughs> Two years later, I'm married to the guy. He gets this great job offer to come uh, and work for a company in New York City. Personal life crosses with your career, and you have to make choices. And as the Jesuits will tell you, because San Ignatius is the master on discerning of the spirit and discerning of your choices. You have to decide what is my will, what is God's will, and what's the plan of my life that would take me to where I need to go. And sometimes where I need to go may not be exactly where I want to go, but it is where the greater picture of the best plan for the best version of myself is meant to go. So, landing my philosophical comment, here I go. The guy says, would you marry me? And of course I said yes. So I left Mexico, my career, and everything I had. And by then, I had already been in, bar in banking about 10 years, had a mid-senior position, had already a team of, you know, like 15 people reporting to me, had about a billion dollars portfolio under management of, you know, corporate clients, a variety of uh, credit lines, etc. had progressed well, had finished also my MBA. So, you know, wasn't doing that bad, but I wanted to get married and I loved the guy and he asked and I said yes. So, I came over to the U.S. Um, with a plan. I put together a plan for my bosses there. The bank that I was working for had a New York office. I didn't need sponsorship or visa or anything like that because with my husband, I was going to get all of those, um, you know, things to 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 come <coughs> uh, legally to the country. And uh, I just put together a plan for transitioning. They supported me because I had consistently delivered on my commitments from day one as an employee. So, second lesson learned. Not only use your talents, your skills, and everything that you're good at, but also always deliver on your commitments. Always find opportunities to um, show yourself in a gracious way, you know, exposure, what I mean by that is there are several opportunities in companies for the extra project, the additional thing that nobody wants to do. And many times you don't want to volunteer for that either, but if you raise your hand and you do it, almost every time pays back. I was that type of person and have always been. So when I needed, uh, favor slash concession sort of accommodation on my current situation on the personal side, and I put together a reasonable plan for transitioning, my boss and my boss's boss were willing to accommodate that situation for me and let me come to New York City working from the New York agency while I transitioned into another job, and that's what I did. Then, you know, I, I sent my resume to every person I knew, one of them in GE Capital, joined GE Capital, and then from there, I, my international career took off. 
I probably um, seeing you standing there means that I need to stop. What I want to tell you from there is that the network I had created up to that point in time got me to G Capital. But what I've done since then to now has been taking calculated risks and new moves in my career, consistently doing what I just shared. Think big and never give up. A little girl in Mexico with an accent never thought that was going to be having a more than 20 plus years international career with GE Capital and then sell all of those businesses when GE decided to divest globally because that doesn't happen unless you think big and never give up. Thank you, Margarita. And yes, I, I gave you the subtle signal, not because that wasn't fascinating, but because we would like an opportunity for our audience to also join in with questions. And I certainly have some questions for all of you, so I'm going to pose sure. the first one to give you guys a chance to think of what your questions may be. Emily, our museum assistant, does have a microphone to make it easier for you to make your contribution heard. Uh, but my uh, question is actually picking up on something Margarita said. You mentioned the word mentorship. And I wanted to ask really each of you, if you could briefly mention, was there a woman who mentored you when you were early on in your career? And how do you perceive mentoring toward younger women and also younger men? And maybe I can ask a question, maybe some students in the audience have wondered, which is, how do you actually get a mentor? Do they approach you? Do you select them? What is your, what's your thoughts on that? Liz, I'll just start with you because you're closest to me. Uh, actually, my mentor was a man. Uh, he was uh, the chair of the history department. Uh, I, I think we selected each other. Uh, so I, there's something about that mutuality. But, uh, but yes, I would say that's who I would select. And, and to this day, I'm still in contact with him. Yeah, I, and I was just going to note, I mean, one of the things in the research is that mentorship is so important for women in management, is having a mentor early in your career. I think i just throw that out. Um, actually, if I think of a, of a key mentor that influenced my entire life in terms of, of my life, um, it was actually um, the head of the athletic department at Providence College. I, I was at Providence College in the 70s, and it just went co-ed. And I was actually on the first women's softball team and first women's ice hockey team there. And I worked for the athletic director. And she was from New York City, and we always, and she liked this term, I'm not saying it to be facetious, we called her the New York broad, because <laughs> she was powerful. And she had that New York accent, and Dave Gavitt at the time was athletic director, and she would fight for us for, you know, she fought for us for uniforms, and when I was in hockey, the ice time, and um, trips, and funding. Um, and she, what she always used to say, uh, the same idea that you can be anything you want to be, um, as, as, as a woman, as an individual, um, all you have to do is work really hard um, and be authentic. And um, so she was, she was like a huge influence on my life as a mentor, not in a work environment, but I think she set the stage for a little bit of fearlessness in terms of going after whatever I want and not listening to someone say no to me, <laughs> because she never did. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, my first mentor was, uh, was a man. Um, most of my career, I've worked with more male <laughs> um, than female. And actually, that was a very interesting mentorship because he actually selected me to mentor me, and then we built a great relationship from that. He saw some things in me that he wanted to push me um, to do a lot better. And I, I also mentor other individuals. And I started out with one person right now that I can think of that I started out as a mentor, and I've switched over to being a sponsor because this person has is doing so well that I'm now um, a sponsor for this person. So I've switched over to that because once you get to a certain level in your career, you need that sponsorship to move you forward. Mm -hmm. So Great. that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. I've had um, male and female mentors in, uh, in my career. I think um, the first one that I had, the, the first manager that I ever had, she was a um, tall southern firecracker. She just the unbelievable amounts of energy and um, a single parent um, and just a force to be reckoned with. And always made time for, no matter how busy she was, she always made time just to really listen and to, to check in. And um, she's, a, she's a good influence. Um, I still, uh, I'm still in contact with her. And um, you know, it's been a while. And I had um, one mentor at Travelers who um, 
very, very similar, uh, really makes time and um, from the heart, like, I don't, I don't know that any, it was Rich Wasquez, I don't know that anyone ever could say a negative thing about this person, he passed away, which is very sad. But um, hooking up with mentors, I think sometimes it, there's been meetings or someone will come up to you and say, personality-wise, you kind of click, can, can we, can, that, can I be a mentee or, um, and I've done that with people too, like to, mm -hmm. if, have a coffee or, so if, if you feel that you, you click with someone or someone, either a professor or anyone um, that you come across, I think it's worthwhile reaching out. And sometimes that could be a little vulnerable for people to reach out, but I, I, I think it always pays off. My first mentors, um, and they both were sort of mentors at the same time, w were a man and a woman. The woman was um, a friend of my mom who was the only executive uh, woman friend of my mom. My mom did not have a corporate career. That's a whole other long story. But um, you know that was not what happened usually in her generation in, in Mexico. But this friend of my mom was an executive woman in the equivalent of the Federal Reserve uh, Bank in Mexico. And um, when my mom told her that her daughter, Margarita, Margarita found a job in a bank, you know, so she's like half her old. And she took me under her wing. She told me so many things from, you know, how to look like an executive, how to poise myself, how to present myself in a meeting. Not that my parents hadn't given me, um, you know, social skills or the way to present, but just, all of those little insights that sometimes we think we know and we don't really always know, she gave me a lot of those insights, um, even from you know, uh, hair, makeup, jewelry, uh, okay, lots of things, especially you know, in, in societies like the Latin American societies, Mexico and, and around, that's critical, right? So she gave me a lot of insights of that nature. Um, the, the male mentor was actually my dad. My dad was in the corporate world in Mexico in high positions, and he knew how you know, things happened in corporations and how to coach me in a way that um, you know, I, could, I could survive. Those two were instrumental in my first uh, years. When I came to the US, I also, um, in GE Capital, developed a relationship with a man and a woman who were in the international division, my group. Um, and it just happened out of affinity of personality and um, how we worked. The company also had a program to assign mentors to you. That happened to me like in my third year in the company. If you performed well, they gave you as an award, a mentor, and that was someone pretty senior in the organization. It was like a, a special thing that the company would, would give you. That person today is still someone with whom I in, I'm in contact. And turning a mentor into a sponsor to your previous comment, he is the man who when, the, when he was very high up in the organization, continued to go up, needed a chief risk officer for the Latin American region. He's the one who picked me. He had seen my career from the get-go, and we always kept in touch. So when he knew, like he needed someone he could trust and knew enough about, he picked me and he said, we need you to take this job. So how critical it is to develop those relationships so you can then, when you're higher up in the organization, turn those mentorship relationships into sponsorships. But you don't turn them into that. They turn into that because they see you performing, delivering on your commitments, being confident, having grit, all of the things that you've shared with us. Thank you for your beautiful thoughts. But I attest that it happened to me, just what you shared with us. So true. Thank you for all of those wonderful comments. And I wonder, do anyone in the audience have questions for our panelists? Perhaps our panelists might have questions for each other. That's fine, too. Yeah. 
I couldn't hear you. What, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> How do you balance work and life? Um, you know, typically, let's say, like, one, sometimes, like, for me, I work <coughs> six in the morning till 30 most days. Uh, it varies on the weekends, but how do you keep that balance to where you're not, or how do you decide what needs a priority in your life? I can go first. I'll tell you, for instance, how I do that. Um, balance is a personal decision. For some people, 10% in personal life and 90% in work life is balance. So balance is a personal decision. That's the first thing we all need to understand. So you have to decide what is balance for you. Balance also changes throughout the various stages of your personal life and your professional life. So you need to calibrate dependent upon the stage of your personal life and your professional life how to choose when to use your time to be with your family and when to use your time to be at work. Let me give you one example. When I was a chief risk officer of G Capital Latin America, I had almost no time with my family. Before I took the job, we made the decision as a family. It was a hard decision because I knew the job was a job in which I had to serve the team I was leading and I had to serve the interest of the company. And those would have a priority over many things that perhaps my family was going to need at a point in time. I needed my husband to be a very strong partner to step into things that I would have stepped into at other stages of our family's life in terms of needs for my daughter, even things that he would have needed as my partner in life, as a person that I love. And he needed to know that that's what's gonna be required of him at that moment because I was gonna be demanded of other things. But at other stages of my career, for instance, when I gave birth to my daughter, I took a job at GE where I was the global leader, global leader, so I still had global responsibility, of um, Six Sigma for one of GE businesses, GE Real Estate, Lean Six Sigma, a division of Six Sigma, for GE Real Estate. So I worked on projects, I could schedule my time and my travel, and I had flexibility. I didn't have to be in front of customers, I didn't have to structure transactions. Those were projects that I could put the pace on, and I had a team that I could delegate many things to and do it differently. So I could be with my daughter certain hours of the day and shift accordingly. And I don't wanna take over the time for others to answer, and I'm elaborating too much perhaps, but the way you balance is understanding what's the stage of your life that you're at. Who are those in your life that you care the most? And how do you make agreements with them on what their needs are going to be and what you can give them? Always, obviously, deliver your best self to them because they don't deserve less than that. And also knowing what is the um, commitment that you're taking with the company which is entrusting you with the job it's giving you. And if you are a leader in the organization, there are many lives that depend on you, on your decisions, and on your leadership choices. You cannot let them down. There are also bosses up over you who are trusting your ability to not lose money, to make sure that everything is fine. So you cannot say, my kid is sick today and I'm not coming to work. Well, guess what? If you're one of those top ones, you have to be there. So you balance according to those two things. I'm sorry with I elaborated too no, much, but I perhaps like, you guys agree I think, with um, Yeah, I like everything you said. Um, I would add, I think you also have to know yourself. You have to know 
how do you function at optimal performance? I know for me, I need at least seven hours of sleep, I have to have water near me, and I need to work out, because if I don't work out, I'm going to be a little snappy. <laughs> so so you, you to really balance, I liked your comment about it's a personal prep, it's a personal decision how much work and how much home life, but knowing how you can function the best, I think, is very important, and you need to stick with that. I'll just quickly add that taking care of you is very important um, because when you are doing well and you're physically fit, mentally and physically, you can accomplish so much. I'm speaking. I, I'm speaking from a place where I actually, for many years, I had um, two two elderly parents in my home. Um, I had caregivers and I had a very demanding job, and I did all that and also being on the board, and nothing failed on my job. So time management is, ex is crucial. Once you manage your time, it's amazing how many things you can get done within a day. True. But take care of you. And when you do that, it makes a big difference. I'm listening to all of them because I'm going to be perfectly honest. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I'm still struggling. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm caught right now. I've got a grandbaby and I've got elderly parents who have been very ill for about the last mm -hmm. year. And I am struggling. Last semester, I think with you students, I pulled a three or four all-nighters to try to keep up with the work I had to do and take care of them. So I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. So there's some great advice here. I do agree with uh, taking care of you, and I still haven't quite done that sufficiently yet, taking care of me. Um, but I think, I think it is difficult. I also will add, I think your generation, I think, are facing um, really a tough go in terms of looking at a future in business or whatever you're doing for a career with the with the time commitments. Technology sort of straps you to the job and it is it is very difficult. I watch my kids who are in their 30s now and what they're going through and it's difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm glad for this advice you three have given me and I'm going to I'm going to take that to heart and think a little more how I can manage my life and my time. So thank you. <laughs> I wish I had words of wisdom for you as well but I think there's something to be said for life stages. Some, sometimes there's greater labor intensity. Kids are young, yes. kids are older. Um, but here's something I'd like to say that has nothing to do with my life, and this is where I think women should stand up and, and um, fight uh, for an infrastructure that makes uh, it possible to do the best job we can do. And, and I, I say that because I think it just deserves a certain amount of activism. I think there are ways in which the workplace is organized around men's life stages and not women's life stages, mm -hmm. and I think that's a fundamental mistake. I'm a, a big believer in building a support team. I, I love the West African proverb, it takes a village, because it does take a village, uh, and the tendency on the part of women is to say, well, I've got to do this. Well, yeah, you do, uh, but I think there's something to be said for A, building a support team, but also pushing um, management systems uh, to acknowledge the fact that we have multiple responsibilities. So I'm just going to throw in a little activism there. Mm -hmm. I love what you said. I love what you said, and I stand for that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, my grandmother, how she balanced life, was that every summer she went to Europe. She would tell the clients, you must have your, you know, approve the sketches before I leave because I'm off to Europe and you won't see me until I get back. So that's how she balanced. She also had mentors and she also had a support system because, you know, bringing up a mother, my, my mother, on her own as a single mom. Mm -hmm. So even back then, support system was big. Yeah. Mentors were big. And going on vacation, mm -hmm. you know, she went over Cupid. to Europe also to get renewed. Mm -hmm. She saw that, yeah. like yoga, you know, you go. Yeah. 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 And get so you're saying food. going to Europe without <laughs> an iPhone to tether you to the job right. yeah. was right. key for Hildreth. Yes. yes. Yeah. And people would say, you know, did you go and, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. sketch, yeah. you know, and that's but she great. went and got inspired. I mean, she did go to Ravenna and Constantinople, and she did go to Russia. So she's traveled the world, and she used to take her 16 millimeter camera, um, yeah, movie camera, and all those movies have been uh, digitized down at the archives. Yeah, 88 of them. Are they at the Smithsonian or are they? Yeah, the archives. Okay. Yeah, of American art. Yeah, all her papers. 
yeah. you know, are down there. We have all her letters. So and if anyway. you come up to the gallery, you will see a video shot at yes. the 1939 World's Fair in color. A woman shooting in color film in 1939, and it's yes. Hilda's doing a video of her own work at the World's oh, Fair in New York. So <laughs> certainly yeah. come up and see that. Yeah. I do want to ask one more question, and then we'll leave a few minutes if anyone wants to come up and ask you guys questions I personally. just want to highlight support system. I, I yes. should have said that, too. Yes, yes. When I was answering, the, yes, support system is key. And, and, and Catherine, that's probably what you need to insert into what you're de right. De right. dealing with. Help. Because yes. sometimes yes. we don't realize the things we need to yes. just yeah. pass on yeah. to someone else mm -hmm. and um, and monitor. And then let it go. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. then let it go. Yes. I'm sorry, if, Michelle, I didn't mean to No, no, that's quite but, right. But that's yeah. critical. Otherwise, yeah. you can't. Yeah. And this might tie into my final question, which is, if you could each go back in time and tell your 20-year-old self one critical piece of advice, and it must be only one, oh. one choice, what would it be? You don't start with me. Okay, I'm going to start with Maisie. She's right in the middle. She yeah, thinks she's not going to get picked first, yeah. but she is. Surprise. Wow. Maisie, what would you tell 20-year-old you? To just relax. Mm -hmm. Who gets the ball? This is a hard one. Yeah, it is. It is hard. <laughs> have more fun. Yeah. Just relax. Have more fun. Yeah, have more fun. Relax doesn't, you know, to do that. <laughs> okay, different, different choices here. Have, have more fun. Kathy, what would you say? Oh, that's a really hard thing, yeah. Um, I pick one thing, huh? I don't know. I, you know, it, to me it sort of says that you want to change your path a little bit, if, if advice, and I'm not sure I changed my path. I, I think I was really happy with my, the way my life rolled out and, and, you know, and different stages of life. Um, so I think I would have said, yeah, just keep just on doing proceed. what you're just doing. Just keep on doing what you're doing and proceed as, as you're proceeding, yeah. Great. Margarita, Lauren, who will it be? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think too hard. Yeah. I think the, the theme about just taking, like slowing down and relaxing, maybe okay. being not so much in your head on what's the next thing, mm -hmm. but being like present in the moment, I think, uh, I, I think that would probably be the coaching I'd give myself. One word. <laughs> Pre <laughs> present. <laughs> present. <laughs> Margarita. I think I would tell myself um, don't try to prove to everyone how good you are. Just, mm -hmm. just believe in yourself without having to prove it to others, right? I guess it's self-confidence maybe, it would that be? How do I make it one word? <laughs> That's right. it's one word. Well, just one idea, but we'll, we'll take it. That was great. So thank you for that, that range of advice. Thank you to all of you for coming to our panel. If you have questions, I think our speakers might be willing to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. If some of you who are students might have an inquiry you would like to make. Uh, thank you so much. Come to the show before it closes Saturday. Thanks. Great. Great.